so welcome back to the book of Exodus. We're over here in chapter 31 today, verses 12 to 14. We're going to break up this section on the Sabbath into two parts. And what in the world is the Sabbath doing in here in the book of Exodus in the middle of this chapter? I thought we were just describing the sanctuary. Well, let's read. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, But as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Therefore you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Okay, so we're going to pause there today and just take this first portion. So what in the world is the Sabbath doing here in the middle of the book of Exodus, in the middle of a description about the sanctuary? How is it that there's any, uh, why is it there? What's going on? And so remember that there is two kind of ways of looking at things. You have the holiness of the sanctuary, right? You have these holy spaces we've been describing. You know, if you touch it wrong or you go in the wrong place, you die. That's, that's kind of significant. And then you have the holiness, not only of place, but you have the holiness of time. Okay, so Sabbath is talking about parts of time that God has marked off and made holy. So it's interesting in the a lot of the pagan temples and things that were created, uh, the ultimate thing, the ultimate holy thing for them, if you could call it holy, was place. And what's interesting here is that God, although he's just outlined for five, for six chapters, uh, the holiness of the sanctuary in terms of place, watch this, he now interrupts everything as he's describing it to Moses, and he is saying to us what? And we're going to see today and tomorrow. Sabbath, the holiness of time, is superior. The holiness of place takes a back seat to the holiness of time. When Sabbath comes things are going to shift. When Sabbath comes, you are going to observe the Sabbath. The Sabbath will have preeminence. There are still morning and evening sacrifices that happen, yes, but the Sabbath is outlined here, and also there's a penalty put in. There wasn't a penalty written in, into the Ten Commandments, but here it says, yeah, penalty by the way, death, okay? So God is making very clear the preeminence of time. That what is holy, God has, has said that the Sabbath is more important than the preeminence of place, okay? So time is more important than place in respect to the relation between the sanctuary and the Sabbath. Kind of interesting piece here, and this is thrown in, by the way, you might know that the next chapter, we're almost there, 32, it's going to be, guess what, don't you know, the golden calf the worship of the golden calf. And then we're going to get the Sabbath again afterwards. So the Sabbath is kind of at the end of this section of Scripture. So I've got a couple of other little notes here I wanted to bring up to you. A couple of thoughts from Hamilton's commentary, page 524, not his exact words, but this paragraph about the Sabbath follows immediately after the lengthy instructions about building the tabernacle and making the vestments for the clergy. There is also a paragraph about the Sabbath that immediately precedes the actual building of the tabernacle, and that's going to be in 3512. We're not there yet, but we're headed there. The placement of the notice about the Sabbath, first as a conclusion, the one we're seeing right now, and then as an introduction to this last segment we're going to get to, is a way of highlighting the Sabbath, signaling the work of the tabernacle must not trump the Sabbath or ignore it. Interesting observation by Hamilton. Yes, and we just kind of said the same thing, you know, that preeminence of time's holiness is greater than the preeminence of space's holiness, as God puts it. And one other thought here that I was quite striking to me, and again, the commentary pointed it out, I hadn't thought of it. Notice this, one other point that was of special interest. This is the only uh, place that spells out a penalty for Sabbath violation. It's this verse right here. There's this penalty, it's death. You know, there's the general thing about the guy collecting sticks before, but this one is very specific. Penalty is death. There are two penalties mandated, right? Verse 14 says that the individuals to be put to death, they're put to be put to death, and then also it says they're to be cut off from the midst of the people. What's interesting here is, check this out, Leviticus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, that's the only other place where we see both of these put together, death penalty and being cut off from the people. Do you know what that's for in Leviticus? Do you remember? 
Look at this. The only other violation that calls for this double consequence, death and being uh, cut off from the people, is giving your children to Molech, putting your sacrificing your children to the false god Molech and we're burning them in the fire. Sabbath breaking here is a line and the only other place in the whole Bible, whole book, here, front to back, the only other place where that comes up is killing, murdering your innocent, your infants by burning them on the altar to Molech, burning them alive, which is how it was done. Kind of interesting. The Sabbath maybe is more important than you've been thinking. The seventh day Sabbath, there is no Sunday Sabbath. Seventh day. So anyway, just tell, I'm just saying, right? We're just looking at the Bible. This is what God is saying. And so we're just noticing a couple of interesting pieces. Okay, we'll talk some more about the Sabbath tomorrow morning. I'm going to leave it there for now. But here in the middle of the book of Exodus, God is dealing with sin and the Sabbath, strangely, but not actually strangely, the Sabbath is put into the highlight again by God himself. Maybe some people need to take much more seriously the worship of God on the seventh day. The seventh day, reminding us that he is the creator. We are the created. He is the creator, and he deserves our worship. And on that basis, the Bible calls for us to worship him. And yet so many are so busy worshiping ourselves. We're so smart. We figured out that it, God didn't create it to begin with. It evolved. It just sort of happened. It just, just natural processes caused all this. Anyway. Okay, love you and pray that God will bless you on this day. See you tomorrow morning.